Coming up on Dare to Love Muslims. Today, Muslims are living in nearly every community across the U.S., but most people are hesitant to reach out to them. Samia's guest today spent many years living in an Islamic country and talks about ways to build social bridges with your Muslim neighbors. Also today, hear which European country has Islam as its number one growing religion. And an American woman shares her story of how she reaches out to Muslim women wherever she goes. Welcome, dear viewers. I'm Samia Johnson. Thanks for tuning in. Is there a difference between the Muslim living in Yemen, for example, and the Muslim who lives in a Western country? My guest, Audra Shelby, who lived in Yemen for many years, will disclose some comparisons and differences that are important for us to know about the Muslims who live in our neighborhoods and communities. Now, every week, we highlight an Islamic country to learn about its people. Today, I chose a European country instead, England, because Islam has become its fastest growing religion. Watch this one minute report. Every year, millions of Muslims immigrate and settle into Western countries. One of those countries is England. More than 5% of England's 53 million people are Muslim. In the city of London, Islam is the greatest minority religion, making up over 12% of the population. Some neighborhoods in East London are 30% Muslim. This large concentration of Muslims in London has resulted in a high number of restaurants that serve halal food. One in 10 people under 25 are Muslim while Christianity is in decline, according to the 2011 UK census. An aging Christian demographic could mean Islam will be the dominant religion in the UK in 10 years. London's population is actually a picture of what's happening in all of Great Britain. In the past decade alone, 600,000 white Londoners have moved out of the capital, though the population has grown by more than a million due to immigration. Pray for a revival among England's Christians that would bring new life to dying churches. Pray for new immigrants to be confronted with a vibrant Christian witness and for inner city neighborhoods to be infused with the gospel message. Just as in England, Muslims are increasing in other Western countries. Some even suggest that by 2050, many European countries will be mostly occupied by Muslims. I will discuss this topic and many more today with my guest, Audra Shelby. Audra, welcome to our show. Thank you, I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you. Audra is the author of Behind the Veils of Yemen, a mesmerizing page turner that tells Audra's own story of living in Yemen. And her most recent book is The Grip of Lions and Veils, a captivating novel where Audra uses her insight to the interior of Yemen culture to write a story that keeps pace with the current world affairs about Muslim extremism. Both books are on our website and we have a special offer. We will show it later for our viewers. Audra, I want to discuss with you today uh, more about the Muslims who live in the West. I know that you lived in both worlds, the US and Yemen. So what is uh, what are the main differences between the Muslims who live in a country like Yemen and those who immigrate and have been living here in the U.S. for quite some time? Well, first we need to remember that in a place like Yemen, it's against the law to share your faith. It is difficult to try to get to know them or getting into their homes. Um, even though the people are very curious mm -hmm. and there's opportunities that arise for them and they invite you into your home, you're the foreigner there. In our country, they come leaving a very communal social environment to being here in the United States where everybody's independent, everybody has their own lives, and they are alone. They're cut off from their culture. They've been thrust into ours. A lot of times the women are lonely mm -hmm. and away from everything is foreign. They can't communicate with us. So there's and in the United States, it's not against the law to share your faith with a Muslim. Yes. So it's a very different situation. It is. And I think when Muslims come here, uh, they become more open to uh, uh, being introduced to uh, different people, different tastes also, the culture. And maybe that is a good way to introduce uh, them to our culture, which is the Christian faith, not the American or the British or 
or the Australian, but the Christian faith and how we live as Christians. Absolutely, yes. There's just so many opportunities in the holidays that we share. I mean, mm -hmm. um, Muslim women, Yemeni women love a good party. Mm -hmm. You know, what an opportunity to invite someone who's really curious and wanting to know about our culture into your home yes. for a holiday. So what do you say to our viewers? Uh, how do we approach a Muslim family or a Muslim young woman uh, in a very friendly way? Well, uh, first of all, get to know a little bit about Muslim, Muslim their culture, mm -hmm. where they're coming from, what Muslims believe. Um, second, be unapologetic about being a Christian. Um, the Muslims are unapologetic about their faith. Very much so. They go into the store, they're wearing their hijab, they're not trying to pretend that they're not Muslim. We don't need to try to pretend that we're not Christian and, and worrying about offending them with our Christianity. Yes. Drop that. Um, and then use the opportunity. If you understand a little of the culture, it's important for us to respond a culture to them in a culturally appropriate way. If I know I'm going to go visit a family, I'm not going to sit there and talk to the husband as a woman at the mm. door when that's offensive and it will be could be misinterpreted by the husband yes. as a flirt, mm -hmm, even mm -hmm. though everything I'm doing is appropriate. Neither am I going to go over to a Muslim's house in a shirt, a T-shirt and shorts, because I want this man to know I am also a devout woman mm -hmm. who's coming to visit his wife. and. One of the things that Muslim men fear about their wives is that they're going to come over here and be morally corrupt yes. and, uh, by our Western influences. So I need to present myself up front as a godly woman who's respectful of their culture and, and know that I need to be speaking to the women. My husband needs to be speaking to the husband of, of the woman, the yes. family, mm -hmm. and to begin communicating in an appropriate way, even though they're in our country, mm -hmm. respecting their culture. Yes, and talking about that, I always say uh, people of those cultures, they look at themselves as visitors or newcomers to this country, and they're expecting Americans or British or Australians to welcome them and take the first step and initiate yes. it. Right. Isn't that right? It is, uh -huh. and they are so society, they love parties, they love this, and, and they would just eat up, an op literally, an opportunity yes. for us to have them over to, into our home mm -hmm. for a party or a celebration or mm -hmm. just to explain. They're curious yes. and, about what we do. And their culture, they have to reciprocate yes. because it's an honor and shame right. uh, based uh, culture. Yes. So they have to reciprocate and invite you to their homes. Absolutely. And uh, if you just bake some cookies that don't have lard or marshmallows in them right. and knock on the door, give them and say, hey, we'd like to get to know each other yes. and uh, maybe have some tea together or coffee, I think th the lady would be willing to do that. I think so too. I yes. think so, especially if you are sure a woman is in a more conservative, and it's important for us to distinguish where they're from so that we know how we need to respond to them. If and it's we don't just have women. To, yes, and we don't have to guess. We right. can ask them. Yes. And that's the core thing with the Western mindset is I don't want to ask questions that might be private. There's nothing private in a uh, culture <laughs> that no. is Yemen or North yes. Africa or the Middle East. So you can ask any question. Where are you from? What does your husband do? Uh, how old are your kids? Uh, do you uh, go to the mosque? Do you pray? Are you a devout Muslim? We can ask anything and they yes. would be willing to answer, but then they would also ask right. us and we have to be willing to be open and transparent and, and, at the same time. And unapologetically devout Amen. of following Jesus. Amen. Audra, let's take a short break to show our viewers how they can get your books. And there's a special offer today on our website. So call us or log in uh, and order the books. And then I want to talk about Muslim women with Audra and what we might have in common with them. So don't go anywhere. What percentage of Muslims worldwide are considered devout extremists? Is it A, 70%, B, 50%, or C, 10%? The answer right after this. Behind the Veils of Yemen captures the harrowing journey that Audra Grace Shelby and her family experienced as Christian missionaries in conservative Islamic Yemen. In a culture dangerously different from her own, Audra gives us glimpses of a world most have never seen and how the grace of God touches lives in the midst of an Islamic stronghold. And now, inspired by her life experiences in Yemen, Audra Grace Shelby has just released a new fictional work 
The Grip of Lions and Veils tells a riveting story of Islamic terrorism as seen through the eyes of Kellyanna Coleman, a wife and mother ripped from her family in a deadly explosion and taken captive by Assad the Lion, deep in the heart of Yemen. Don't miss this special combined offer. Order on our website, daretolove.tv, or call us now at 832-220-4040. 832-220-4040. So what percentage of Muslims worldwide are considered devout extremists? The answer is C, 10%. Let's continue our conversation with Audra Shelby, who lived many years in Yemen with her husband and children, ministering to local Muslims. Audra continues to reach Muslims in the U.S. and writes resources to help us understand the background and culture of Muslims, especially women. Audra, uh, we talked a little bit before this short break uh, about the Muslim women of Yemen and those who come and live here uh, in the West. Talk to me a little bit more about uh, the openness of the Muslim woman who comes here, whether there is a change that takes place in her throughout the years. I think there is a change. For one thing, she's coming into this country with preconceived notions Mm -hmm. about a Christian woman. And when she comes into this country, she's going to begin to learn that we're not what we've been portrayed as, hopefully, that we're able to portray a godly woman, a true godly woman. And number two, she's going to become, even as much as her husband may want to shield her Mm -hmm. from the immorality, so to speak, of the Western world, she's becoming extremely exposed to what Americans are really like. Yes. And if she has been told her entire life how evil Americans are, she's going to be gunning, she's going to begin to learn that it's not quite as bad as she believed it to be. That's and the people are not as evil mm-hmm. as they've been made out to be. But you know what? So is her husband. Mm-hmm. Her husband is going to slowly relax in America, I think, and and maybe he's going to relax a little bit with his wife. You're going to have younger daughters that are going to be connecting with other teenage daughters and are going to become more, probably a little more rebellious. Especially you know, in school. In school, yeah. Yes. They're going to be wanting some of the same privileges. Mm-hmm. And that could either spark an, more openness in a father or... Send her, you know, send her back to to her and country. And many get sent back to yes. the country to be married, and uh, then come back married as well. Yes. Do you think we have anything in common? Oh yes. Through Christ's followers who are women, common with a conservative Muslim woman. Absolutely. First of all, we are women yes. at, at the core. Mm-hmm. I, I always laugh. You know, um, we look at the women clothed in black as these big black blobs mm-hmm. in, that go in the mall or in the discount shopping center or whatever. And I stop and think, hey, wait a minute. Do you know that the Balto, there's a style for the Balto and a new one comes out every year? Yes. You know, <laughs> I, I'll never forget when we lived in Hodeida, 120 degrees in the summer. And the style that year was fur trim around, you know, fake uh-huh. fur trim around the baltos and they wore it. Fashion is important to a Muslim woman just as it is to one of us, to me, you know. Yes. They love makeup. Mm-hmm. They love hairdos. They love perfume. And you they see love pretty those, clothes. those things when yes. you are attending events with them without men being Yes, uh, underneath the, all of the garb outer covering is a woman who loves so many of the same things that we do, has the same dreams for her children, loves her children, wants to see them grow up and mm. excel, and, and loves fashion and beauty and, and mm. all the things mm. that we have. So there's a lot of common ground there. Amen. And for us as Christian women, uh, I find uh, sometimes a lot in common with the conservative Muslim woman because she wants her children to be raised up in a pure environment, yes. and not allowing them to watch uh, rated uh, movies and TV and websites and all these things. Yes. So once we share with her, hey, I'm the same thing. Yes. Your morals are not higher than mine, yes. but mine don't come out of fear. 
Exactly. They come because I love the Lord and I want to uh, reciprocate his love and by absolutely. living a pure life. And sharing too our own concerns with the immorality that we see around mm -hmm. us. You know that this bothers us too. Yes. It's not acceptable in a Christianity just because it's acceptable in America. Yeah. Do you think Muslim women are approachable? Absolutely. Mm. I really do. They are probably standoffish. I think that a lot of Muslim women come into this country expecting to be hated or expecting animosity mm. from other women. So they have their defenses up. And I think when you respond with kindness, the times that I have spoken, I learn a couple of words in Arabic and just greet them in Arabic. You could just see this change. I mean, they, they turn around and they're just like, I can't believe you just spoke to me. Amen. You know, and it's just, it's so welcome. They are far away from home and their culture and just a kind word or a greeting, mm. especially in a culture where greetings and manners is so important. Mm. That to be recognized and, and acknowledged um, is very important. I always say uh, in churches, you might be the only person who have smiled yes. uh, and looked at this veiled woman as a human being in the yes. supermarket. And this might be the point where her heart is stirred to ask questions. Why is this person different? Yes. Maybe their beliefs are different. Yes. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. We will continue the conversation with Good. you again. But now let's watch this short clip that gives us practical ways to connect with Muslim women. And then an American woman will share briefly how God prompted her heart to witness to Muslim women. We'll come back after this to close our time with Audra with two questions you might be thinking of right now. Connecting with the Muslim women who live in your community may seem hard. You don't see that there's anything you have in common with them. You may not understand the culture they come from, especially if they come from a non-Western background, such as Indonesia, Pakistan, India, Saudi Arabia, or North Africa. Keep in mind that Muslim women tend to only form close relationships with other women. Here are a few hints that may help you take the first steps in a more natural and comfortable way. Non-Western Muslim women may keep a different schedule. Many stay up late at night and sleep late in the morning, so it's a wise idea not to call or visit before 10 a.m. You needn't call before you visit, but it's acceptable if you do. When you're visiting, try not to refuse coffee, tea, or food, especially if she's already prepared it and brought it to you. It's easier to talk if you're drinking tea together, and it can be quite an offense if you refuse to eat with her. If you have dietary restrictions, be sure to explain that to her so she won't be insulted. It's not unusual for the television to be turned on and kept on while you're visiting. The Muslim woman may consider this as part of her hospitality to you, ensuring that you don't get bored. Don't be hesitant to invite the Muslim woman into your home. Most of them never get to see the inside of a Western Christian's home even though they might have lived here for years. Observe her forms of hospitality and be sure to extend the same kindness to her when she visits you in your home. Prepare a small snack and share some coffee or tea to make her feel comfortable. If possible, try to meet her practical needs such as taking her shopping, going to the park, or helping her to get an appointment. Many Muslim women who are new to this country will not have a driver's license or an easy means of transportation. Make an effort to meet her more than once. Get her phone number and find a reason to get together at another time. Some reasons to get together might be you want to learn to cook some dishes from her country or you're interested in learning her language. Maybe you can learn from her a certain craft that she's good at. Your children could be another reason for getting together so they can play with her children or help them in their homework. Try to get to know her better. Show interest in her country of origin her culture, and her interests. But most importantly, be genuine in your friendship and don't see her as a ministry project. Like any potential friend, she'll be able to sense your sincerity or the lack of it. Be patient, pray for wisdom, and watch God work. Get all of your questions answered by Samya right here on Dare to Love. Just email your questions to ask at daretolove.tv. I first became aware of Islam and its teachings when I 
took a job in Saudi Arabia with a couple of friends before I was married and moved over there to work. I don't think I had known a Muslim person prior to that. While I was living there, obviously, I was immersed in Islam and got to observe the most strict practice of Islam, as well as developed a lot of personal relationships with Muslim women that I worked with. One of my first reactions was it was pretty clear that Islam did not offer the same respect and dignity towards women that Jesus offers. I saw all of the rules and the regulations in terms of the prayer times, the direction you had to pray, and the food rules, and it just seemed very legalistic. What prompted me to action was, number one, I was immersed in it. So I saw it very intensely, the way the gospel changes my life every day. And I think of these women that don't have peace with God, they don't have the peace of God, they don't have hope, and how can I have this treasure of Christ and not share it with them? The way I feel comfortable reaching Muslim women is I carry DVDs in my purse, the Jesus film and the More Than Dreams DVD, and when I'm out in the, at the grocery store, at Costco, at a hospital, airports, these are all places where I've run into them, and I keep them handy so when I see a Muslim woman, I can just walk up to her and I ask her if I can offer her a gift and explain what it is. I receive a variety of responses all the way from scorn and disdain to genuine heartfelt appreciation. The majority of the responses are right in the middle. Slight disinterest or curiosity. One of the most memorable experiences was when my family and I were in the Orlando airport. We had just finished going through security and we were on our way to our gate and I spotted a Muslim woman and so I raced over to where she was and I pulled out a DVD which I carried a stack in my suitcase and I offered one to her and she held it and was looking at it for a long time. I thought trying to think of a polite way to tell me no but she ended up just saying thank you and then I, we parted ways. I went to catch up with my family. As we got on the train, underground train, to go to our gate, I looked up and I saw her in the car through the windows right in front of us. She saw me and we made eye contact. And through the window, she said, thank you, thank you, thank you. That experience encourages me through the next 100 rejections because I realized that Muslim women often have had no opportunity to hear about Christ, and some of them desperately want to know the true God. I think the advice I would give to women who want to reach out to Muslim women is to find a way that's comfortable for them, like the DVDs are for me, to open the conversation with a stranger, and develop compassion for them. Think about what it was like to be lost and without God, without hope, that's very motivating. And I believe God has brought so many Muslims to our country, right to our doorstep, that we can reach out to very easily without spending money to fly to another country, without having the strict laws of a Muslim country that prohibit that kind of speech. So we have the freedom, and God has brought them here. He's commanded us to. Karen is such an encouragement to me. She always has interesting stories of new encounters with Muslim women. We need thousands of women like uh, Karen. Do. Don't you agree, Audra? I do, I do agree. And her message is the same as the conversation we've been having. You know, yes, it is. that uh, these Muslim women need Christ, they haven't heard of him, and find your way. What is the best way that God can use you in reaching out to these uh, Muslim women? Absolutely. God has gifted every one of us with something that we can share. And God gifts us not for our own blessing alone, but also to bless others. Amen, amen. And I promised our viewers before uh, this uh, short break that there are two questions that we might be thinking of, the viewers might be thinking of. And the first one is, 
Well, I don't know any Muslim woman. Where do I find them? Go to the mall. <laughs> Go shopping. Muslim Muslim women love to shop just like we love to yes. shop. They love a bargain. Uh -huh. um, so if you honestly don't have any in your neighborhood, Go to the mall, um, go to the local discount store, the local grocery store, mm -hmm. especially on the weekends, on Saturdays or Sunday afternoons. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you will run into at least one of them. Yes, go to shopping. the ethnic stores in your uh, city maybe. Yes, right? and in a larger city, parks. They yes. take their children to parks. The other questions that I get often as well is, uh, how can I overcome my fear of Muslims and lack of knowledge about their culture? This is what is stopping me from witnessing to the Muslims I know. It is so very important to mm -hmm. understand what Muslims believe, mm. their religion, why they're dressing like they are, why they're practicing what they practice. And there are excellent tools you have some excellent resources right here at mm -hmm. Call of Love Ministries that you can provide, but there's excellent books written that are so easy to read that explain what they believe and why. So it's important to understand um, what they believe so that you know who you're addressing. Thank you, Audra, for great sharing. Thank you for having me here. It's been such a joy. It's been a joy for us as well. I encourage you to get Audra's two books available on our website for a special price. You know, I hope you were inspired today from what you heard. We cannot continue to be on air and produce this program if people like you don't join us in partnership. We totally depend on the Lord to provide for our ministry through His people. We hope you join us today in partnership. You can start your monthly commitment on our website, daretolove.tv, or call us now at 832-220-4040. And maybe God is prompting you to give a special donation of $15,000 or more. This will cover producing and airing two programs that will reach a potential 2 billion people worldwide. Act today, and He who provides for all of us will reward you according to His riches. Christ is coming back soon, so let us be diligent and faithful. Thanks for watching. Meet us here next week, same time. I have three children and I recently accepted Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I came to Lebanon from Syria with my family when more started. I started coming to church where I learned about Jesus Christ. I knelt down and asked him to forgive me of all my sins. And now I am his daughter. There are many similar stories from Syrian and Iraqi refugees who have found Jesus through the Christian Relief Ministries we partner with in Lebanon, Northern Iraq, Turkey, and Jordan. Help us support Christian evangelism to refugees forced from their homes by Islamic extremists in the Middle East. Your tax-deductible gift of $25 or more makes it possible for us to continue reaching refugees with the love of Christ. Call now, 832-220-4040 or go to daretolove.tv and click on Donate to start your partnership. I was a veiled Muslim woman. I took off the hijab because I experienced Jesus in my life. Now He lives in my heart. If you enjoy watching Dare to Love, please consider partnering with us. Your monthly gift of $25 or more will help us continue producing this program and reaching Muslims for Christ. Call us now at 832-220-4040. 832-220-4040 or donate online at daretolove.tv Dare to Love Muslims is made possible by the friends and partners of Call of Love Ministries. Coming up on Dare to Love Muslims. Today, Muslims are living in nearly every community across the U.S., but most people are hesitant to reach out to them. Samia's guest today spent many years living in an Islamic country and talks about ways to build social bridges with your Muslim neighbors. Also today, hear which European country has Islam as its number one growing religion. And an American woman shares her story of how she reaches out to Muslim women wherever she goes. Welcome, dear viewers. I'm Samia Johnson. Thanks for tuning in. Is there a difference between the Muslim living in Yemen, for example, and the Muslim who live in England's Christians that would bring new life to dying churches? Pray for new immigrants to be confronted with a vibrant Christian witness and for inner city neighborhoods to be infused with the gospel message. 
just as in England, Muslims are increasing in other Western countries. Some even suggest that by 2050, many European countries will be mostly occupied by Muslims. I will discuss this topic and many more today with my guest, Audra Shelby. Audra, welcome to our show. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you. Audra is the author of Behind the Veils of Yemen, a mesmerizing page turner that tells Audra's own story of living in Yemen. And her most recent book is The Grip of Lions and Veils, a captivating novel where Audra uses her insight to the interior of Yemen culture to write a story that keeps pace with the current world affairs about Muslim extremism. Both books are on our website and we have a special offer. We will show it later for our viewers. Audra, I want to discuss with you today uh, more about the Muslims who live in the West. I know that you lived in both worlds, the US and Yemen. So what is uh, what are the main differences between the Muslims who live in a country like Yemen and those who immigrate and have been living here lives in a Western country. My guest, Audra Shelby, who lived in Yemen for many years, will disclose some comparisons and differences that are important for us to know about the Muslims who live in our neighborhoods and communities. Now, every week we highlight an Islamic country to learn about its people. Today, I chose a European country instead. England, because Islam has become its fastest growing religion. Watch this one minute report. Every year, millions of Muslims immigrate and settle into Western countries. One of those countries is England. More than 5% of England's 53 million people are Muslim. In the city of London, Islam is the greatest minority religion, making up over 12% of the population. Some neighborhoods in East London are 30% Muslim. This large concentration of Muslims in London has resulted in a high number of restaurants that serve halal food. One in 10 people under 25 are Muslim, while Christianity is in decline, according to the 2011 UK census. An aging Christian demographic could mean Islam will be the dominant religion in the UK in 10 years. London's population is actually a picture of what's happening in all of Great Britain. In the past decade alone, 600,000 white Londoners have moved out of the capital, though the population has grown by more than a million due to immigration. Pray for a revival among